Okay, aloha and thank you for attending tonight's Thursday, April 1st, 2021 Hanalma Talk Seminar Series presented by the City and County of Honolulu and the Hawaii Sea Grant Hanawa Bay Education Program. For the month of April, we are partnering with the Hawaii Audubon Society. We have the pleasure of hosting Susan Scott tonight, who will be talking about every Kolea counts. Um, my name is Gavin E. Y, and I am the Outreach Program Coordinator for the Education Program. I have listed my contact information, the phone number for our office, as well as our email, as, as well as a link to our Hanama Talks website if you're interested in checking out past Hanama Talk seminars, as well as other educational material that our education program is involved with. So the Hanawa Bay Education Program partners with organizations across Hawaii to showcase educational talks with leading researchers, environmental leaders, natural resource managers, and cultural practitioners. Uh, it starts promptly at 6.30 p.m. and ends at 7.30 p.m. and consists of a 45-minute presentation time with a 15-minute question and answer session at the end. Just a few friendly reminders during the presentation, please keep all your questions till the end of the presentation or feel free to type it in the chat box at any time, which is usually on the bottom right hand corner. Please turn off your microphone as well as your video function during the presentations to allow a smoother seminar. So a little background on the Hawaii Autobot Society. It is a nonprofit membership organization that fosters community values to protect and restore native wildlife and ecosystems and conserve natural resources through education, science, and advocacy in Hawaii and the Pacific. And I have included the links to the Hawaii Audubon's website, as well as the Kolea account that Susan will be talking about tonight. So just a little background on the presenter for tonight. Susan Scott is an author of nine books about nature in Hawaii. She has a longtime friendship with a golden plover expert, Dr. Wally Johnson. And in 2018, Dave co-authored a book called Hawaii's Kalea, The Amazing Trans-Pacific Life of the Pacific Golden Plover. With Wally as her science advisor, Susan in 2020 launched a community science pilot called Kalea Count. And tonight she'll give an update on this first ever statewide Kalea Count, sponsored by the Hawaii Audubon Society. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to Susan. Thank you, Gavin. Are we good? Yep. I don't see anybody. Can you see the slideshow? Uh, no, can't see slideshow. Now? Yes? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. I have to do share screen to do it. Yeah. OK, there now we good. Go. Yep. OK. Put everybody on the side. Well, thank you for uh, joining me on this uh, Galea account update. Uh, Wally and I started this uh, website uh, in February 2020, not having any clue what was going to happen in March 2020. So, our, all of our, our best plans of publicizing this Galea account and getting uh, everything organized really didn't work out the way we planned with COVID, but we um, we launched anyway, and we're calling this year a, a, a pilot, a study, just to see how it worked. And one of the reasons that we we set up this program and this, this website was because people uh, asked both Wally and me and, and other people questions that uh, about the Kalea that really no one knows the answers to. So one of the... Uh, big things that people keep asking me is, um, are there more or less Kalea than there used to be? Because I usually see 10 in my park and this year I only saw five and, and those kinds of questions. Or my bird didn't show up in my yard and are, are the numbers decreasing? And we don't really know that. So the only way you can know that is if you have a count. So um, the big problem is there hasn't really been any counts of Kalea since 
Well, the, la the first one was in 1949 and they did uh, what they called sampling representative habitats. And they got 74,000. I'm not really sure how they did the sampling, but as, as we worked through this pilot project this year, we found that the representative habitats don't necessarily mean they're Kalea there. And in sometimes there's way more Kalea in one perfectly similar place than another. So that 1949 study was done by um, before Hawaii was a state by the territory of Hawaii. And um, it's interesting to me when I look at the, the title that they call them game birds. So people were still shooting. They, they weren't shooting birds by then, by 1949, because they stopped the hunting ban began in 1939. But in 1968, there was a count by the uh, Oahu uh, Division of Forestry and Wildlife on Oahu and that hunting ban had already been going for 10 years, but they still call them game birds, which I thought was interesting. They eventually dropped that because they're protected. But um, all of Oahu in 68, they got a total of 5,173 birds, which does not seem like very many because um, Wally Johnson uh, counted birds on just the Oahu golf courses in 1992. He had a, a state permit to do this. And in, the, in those days, in 92, there was only 28 golf courses. You can see there's 37 today, so nine more. And uh, Wally and Pat counted uh, just under 2,000 birds on Oahu, just on, on the golf courses. So that was pretty much the last count that we had of, um, of the Kalea. And the big thing was, um, sorry about that. Not all the golf courses were equal. So when you looked at Wally and Pat's counts, there were two on one 18 hole golf course, that was the low, and 168 on, on another, which is an 18 course uh, golf course. And it didn't seem to matter the golf course was new or old or wooded. It just seemed to be sort of up to the birds of whether they liked it or not. And Wally thought, well, maybe we don't have enough birds to fill all the habitat we have in Hawaii. Maybe there's pesticides. Maybe there's something about some of these places we don't know what that the birds like or don't like. But the problem, big problem with that is it's really hard to extrapolate to just say, well, there's so many birds here. So that means there's probably that many in another place that's very similar. And I had my own experience of, of counting at BYU uh, in Laie and, and one field was identical to another one across a road. And there was no birds on one side and 28 on the other, so. That, that was just my, my own experience of, of how random it can be. Today, there's 82 golf courses in Hawaii, and that does seem to be really perfect Kalea habitat. They really do like most of the golf courses. And so um, that was one of the, the big areas that I was concentrating on during the, for the count for this trial. People also ask me uh, fairly often, if anyone's counting them in their breeding area in Alaska. And so the answer is no. And the reason is you can see from the map, the red dots are the Hawaii birds that were tagged and uh, nested in Alaska. And the blue dots are, are, are Kalea that were tagged in the South Pacific Islands and nesting in Northern Alaska and Siberia. And you can see it's just an enormous area, but also the picture below is the habitat. And this is what it looks like. Uh, I went with Wally in 2018 and it, it's really difficult to ever get a count just because of walking through it is very, very rough and very hard. But also the birds really act differently when they're in Alaska. They're not friendly anymore to people. They're very, very afraid. They're, they're hiding, they're trying to sit on their eggs and can't be in camouflage. And in 2000, uh, that 2018 trip, Wally had put eight satellite tags on birds in Tahiti that he and those uh, the students in the picture from BYU 
tagged in Tahiti and he wanted to get the, the tags back because they cost $1,500 each and you can reuse them. You can recharge the batteries and reuse them. So we went to Alaska, we flew to Nome. There's no roads to Nome. So, uh, and then you drive and drive and drive and then you look for a bird flying, which is not very common. And then we, when you did find, we did find a bird. You can see how hard it is to see. I don't know if you can see that bird, but it's there. Then you have to keep your eye on it and get out there and catch it in a, in a net that doesn't hurt it or the eggs. There's, there it is. And after a week of, of long days of working, we, we recovered four of the eight tags. And that was six of us working pretty hard to find the birds. So the point of it is that's why they really, it's really impossible to get a good idea of how many birds are nesting in the Alaska and Siberia. So the, the big question of are the birds increasing or decreasing? You can't just do one or two years of a count. You really need to do the uh, do this over a number of years. And uh, Wally and I decided that 10 years would be a good goal. So if we could get numbers for 10 years, we could see an increase or a decrease or a plateau. And uh, you know, we may be able to see that over the next few years, but but 10 would be a good number. And Rich, this is. Uh, I tried to put the, the photo credits of people who sent me beautiful pictures, which is one of the great advantages of things uh, of doing the study that I really loved was just getting these wonderful photos from people who are out there seeing them. And um, this one I, I always think of as two angels. This was in the Oahu Cemetery. The other thing is we said, as long as we are getting, uh, asking people to give us information, let's find out if the arrival and departure times are the same year after year. And uh, the photos that don't have photo credits are usually mine. I put my photo credit on this one just because I wanted you to know this is a midway. The really flock together a lot more in the middle of winter. So I was able to get this picture, but um, yeah. So, but we don't know if you are, if the um, arrival and departure times are the same year after year, people write me the email me the uh, record of it. The other thing we don't know is how many Kalea spent summers in Hawaii. And one of my counters, our counters, uh, Cecily um, wrote, emailed me and said she was so happy and so excited because in, your early July, she found several, uh, one, or I think it was several actually, birds at the Waimanalo Wastewater Treatment Plant. So I, I went there and got some pictures of them. Um, and so if you see them, well, we'll talk about that later about how to report the birds you see this summer. And our biggest question was uh, our community members and people who are interested in like the Kalea, they're willing to count and monitor because it, it is some work and there's some uh, effort involved in it. And so we were just really didn't know until we launched, said, well, we'll just launch the site and see what happens. And it got more complicated, of course, because of the pandemic, because then we're all in lockdown. And so we're not really, really sure all of the um, things that will happen in the future happen this year, but this is what we have. So this was the site. I have a local uh, web uh, webmaster uh, team who know Kalea profit to to make the site, and we made T-shirts with another local uh, Aloha. What's his name? I forgot it. It's it's a, a Aloha um, T-shirt factory in here in Hawaii, and so this would we made these to help us fundraise to pay for some of the tagging and some of the expenses and the website, but also so people could wear their shirts and advertise the, the count, it look good too. And uh, one of our local artists helped me design this, design the bird. So my idea was to divide this into big counts, little counts and big counts. The little counts would be uh, the, the birds that people see in their yard or on, on their street corner every day, all year. And then uh, the big counts were gonna be uh, the golf courses, 
uh, the parks that um, we have are blessed to have so many parks, city and, and state parks, the, our resort areas like Koalina, and of course the um, cemeteries are a good hangout, favorite hangout. The military bases really have a lot of grass, grassy areas, a lot of places. So we uh, got permission from a couple uh, given the restrictions of the pandemic, did get on to several uh, bases. And then of course, private ranches, this is Kulo Ranch. And the great thing was for me, and I think for some of the people who counted was, these were places that, oh, tourists go and we know all about and other people, but we have not never really done it ourselves. And so I went out and did it. I took Craig and my niece and her husband went to Kuloa Ranch for the first time because you think of it as a tourist thing. But uh, we had a really good time and uh, it's a little expensive, but it was really fun. And we got to know our island much, much better. Oh, and by the way, there were only about, I think three or four on the, all in all of the Kuloa Ranch because it just wasn't a great habitat place for them. And the other uh, thing that we want, I wanted to do that I really didn't get to do this year, obviously because of the, the virus was the uh, schools. And one, this picture is a little blurry, but a reader sent me this from Kilo and said that her elementary school put, a, put this welcome back Kalea on their sign for um, August when school started. So I really did really want to involve the schools this year, which hopefully we can do next year because this was a bad time to try to ask um, schools to do something extra. So we got some clickers. I ordered some clickers that you could buy or I was giving people who are doing big counts because if you're getting up to over 10, 11, you really need some way of counting and keeping track of how many you have. And then for the golf or the golf courses, I thought, well, I went to the golf courses and they were not very happy to have a non-golfing person driving around one of their carts counting birds because of the liability. A and B because of the pandemic. They had all kinds of rules about not two people riding in a cart and all kinds of things. So I went around to each golf course on Oahu and uh, got some people to take some of these flyers to the big island and Maui to put them at the golf courses, bulletin boards, and see if we could get the golfers to help count. Because when I talked to uh, the, man, the golf manager, um, one, one guy said, the golf organization, I mean, he said, oh yeah, golfers will count birds. They're out there standing around. They enjoy being outdoors. They like the birds. I, I think it's a good idea. Then I talked to another one, another golf or organization and the head of it said, there's no way they're gonna count birds. There's no way. So I thought, well, I don't know. I'm just going to put these flyers out, talk to the, the golf managers and see what happens. So that's what we did. So the, these, these signs are in, in plastic and up at each golf course. And then uh, this is the report uh, page on the website. So I wanted people, I put on here a, a how to do the big count and little count and also a, a link that you could look at here. Uh, to sign up. And before I go there, I want to say we had a map in the beginning that people have often asked me what happened to the map, that when you reported a bird, it would automatically put it on the map. And the problem with that is early on, the map was solid red dots, so much that it was really hard to see, to tell one thing from another. It really didn't give us any information. So we, um, we took that big map off and just left this on as sort of an idea of of what we were doing. And so the link on here gave you this page, which my nephew helped me build with um, Google uh, spreadsheets. So you could open this uh, to whatever area you were in and choose a place to count. So we, if you put an X on there, it graded out. And I, I, I cut this off because we didn't want to publicize people's names and email addresses, but I, I get to see them because I want to contact you and keep in touch. And so, uh, but this was the, this was the, is the uh, way to sign up. And, and I made this 
with a Google Maps, just by going around the state in Google Maps, looking at green spaces. And I had no idea really if the birds were gonna be there or not, but I thought we'll put them on and people can sign up or not. And then we'll see if the birds are there and maybe take the place off next year. Or wasn't really sure about how to go about that. You can see most people signed up. This is just one page, but the places that people did not sign up for, I tried to do myself on my island. And I just want to show when you when you counters enter the report form, this is the form that that I get. This is what happens when you fill this in here. And we had two problems with this. One is that I didn't make two report forms for little counts and big counts. And that was a mistake, which I will fix uh, this summer. I'm going to have all summer while birds are gone to work on this. But uh, the big counts and low counts are have quite different pieces of information. And so next year we're gonna have, if you just have one, just tell me about the bird in your yard or one on your street corner, that'll be one kind of uh, report. And then the big counts will be another. And this is what I see. Uh, I get this in the, um, the, the clay account. When you put something in, this is what I get. And so what we wanted to do is get uh, one, one of the uh, Audubon helpers, workers helped me, uh, said, let's, let's do this uh, by um, maybe we can, we can organ. This is the date that's created, but also I wanted people to say the day that they saw the bird, not the day that they actually got it into the report. And so th that's what that is. And then each island helps me sort uh, for the different islands. So the count really officially hasn't, isn't over. So I haven't compiled any of this, uh, all this data, but um, I've got some, some information. And that is that, you know, over 1500 people and it's still growing every time I look at it, have entered a report, which is fantastic. So the answer to the question is, are the people gonna help us uh, count the birds is, is yes, and, and also monitor their dates. And so you can see I was stuck on Oahu from the pandemic. I, my plan was to travel to the other islands and give talks and slideshows and get some uh, publicity going. But we did get some people on different islands and this is how many reports came from other islands. And I think mostly uh, we just didn't, weren't able to get the word around as, as well as I had hoped so. But still, I think it's a great success. And I think the answer to our question is, will the community help with the community science project is yes. And, and that's good because we want to do it for 10 years. Of all the golf courses on, in Hawaii, we got only seven people signed up and uh, seven on Oahu, two on the big island. So 73 went uncounted, which is an enormous number of birds. So we have to work on that. Wally told me he got permission from the state, from DLNR to count the golf courses. And so I didn't realize that, but I think that would really help us with the managers get, giving us more, uh, more permission to get on, onto the golf courses uh, because yeah, we really want to just borrow a car, get a, go around, count the birds and get off the golf course. So hopefully we'll be able to figure out a way to do that next year. I asked this guy if he would count birds because he is golfing and I, I live on the mid Pacific golf course and we see him and it causes quite a commotion. Everyone goes, oh, guess who's golfing? But he didn't want to count birds. He said he was kind of busy. So <laughs> what we did is on Christmas day, the golf course was closed. So Craig and I and our niece and nephew got our Christmas outfits on and uh, went around and we counted the mid Pacific golf course on Christmas day and New Year's day. So we may be able to figure out some way to do that next year when the golf courses are actually closed and there won't be a liability issue. So we'll, we'll see, working on, working on the golf courses for next year. Uh, a great thing happened was um, uh, Jeff McConnell, who I do not know, sent this photo in that says he works on, on the ranch on the big island on the um, west side and sent this great picture of these birds gathered on September 14th. And he thought they were not there the day before and not there the day after they had just landed here from their migration. So 
That's good. Uh, the birds right now, uh, of course, are all changing colors. Some, some are half changed, some are all the way into their breeding feathers and they're just really fun to watch change. And so what we're really wondering now is if people will please report when they leave. Uh, this was in 2016, this worker at Fort Island looked out the window and saw this amazing scene, which I have never seen. And I hope I get to see it someday, but um, Betty sent it to somebody else who sent it to me and said we could use it. But it looks like a, a big gathering on April 26th. And she said the next time she looked out the window, it was gone. So Fort Island, of course, is off limits to non-military people. So we can't go out there and look. But another place, um, one other place that is a big departure date is uh, Kualoa Regional Park across from the ranch. And several people have told me, including Wally, that they've seen them gathering there. So we should all go out there the end of April and hopefully get lucky if we either see them gathering or see them take off. And so um, those are the only places I know. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you and other uh, Kalea fans will write me and tell me where there are other gatherings. Because it's a big question that people ask me and uh, we all ask each other. It'd be really great to, to know for sure that they're there every year and they leave from that place. Although we still don't know the date, the day. Um, we want to know, sorry, the summering birds, if they spend summers here. Well, I said he has no idea how many birds spend the summers here. But one clue, I, I caught these two birds at, at Punchbowl Cemetery, and the one on the left was encroaching into the space of the one on the right. And the one on the left had not molted into any breeding colors. And so I wondered what was going on with that. And he was, he or she was looking to get into that other space and they ended up into quite a squabble. But I went back after the, all the birds had left in, uh, in May and this bird was here all summer, the one on the left. So one thing you can tell is if you see a bird that's not changed into breeding colors, it may be decided to spend the summer here, maybe underweight, it may, we don't know what's wrong with it, but, uh, and it may go next year. It may just be the first year bird didn't get enough weight to make the migration. So June is the big month to look because by July, some birds are already coming back who left in April, who we, whose nest either failed or they're coming back quite early. And so, um, Ted and Judy Simon saw summer birds in, uh, 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 let's see, where is this? I can't read the top here. Kalani High School, sorry. They live near Kalani High School. And so they got some beautiful, Ted got gorgeous pictures of the birds, three birds that were spending the summer there. So that's a, really a happy, happy thing when you are missing the birds, you can find some that are summer. So it'll be interesting to see. I, I went and saw those three birds there too uh, at Kalani, but it'll be interesting to see if they're there this summer or if, if they decided to go. I wanna say a, just a word about bird rescues because it's come up in the last couple of weeks that people have seen birds with broken legs. And I want, if, if a bird, if a, a plover has one good leg and one bad leg, there's a good chance that it will survive. Uh, several people have told me they've seen birds year after year with only one leg and they do okay. This bird really looked like it had a dislocated ankle. That's the ankle of, the, of a bird. And so we thought, well, if we can catch it, we could be, probably get that leg straightened out and, and it would be okay. So we spent a lot of energy trying to catch the bird, but if you have a bird that has two good wings, there's no way. And we, we were not able to catch it and it, it disappeared. It probably got eaten by a cat, but it, it was hopping around okay. But if you have a bird with a broken wing, there's a chance you can catch it because it can't fly. But if it can fly, there, it, it's really, really difficult. I, I had experienced person from Fish and Wildlife come with a net gun and we just couldn't get it. So anyway, there, if you look at, my, at the website under, um, uh, one of the tabs has got a rescue page and it has uh, Feather and Fur and some other organizations that will, will help. 
And you can also email me and see if there's something that we can do for our bird because we all want to help them. And it's, it's very reasonable to want to do that, but it really stresses them if they can fly and they only have one leg, you just have to let them go. It's, it's hard to do, but I, I wanted to say too that we had this one really beautiful, un very unusual bird that was mostly white, not all white. And so we watched Blanche, I named her Blanche and went to Haya a few times and took some pictures and the problem was Blanche disappeared and Haya State Park, which is right next to it, has an enormous number of feral cats that I counted 35 cats around my car by the time I got back to my car. And I just want to say I have to put my own two cents in that I think we should not be feeding and nurturing feral cats if we like our birds. And there's another sad bird story. This is um, Michael Lilly's Oscar, who he, Michael lives in Laie, and his brother came to visit and rented a car, and the bird was just obsessed with its reflection in this car. And I'll show you, he sent me a bunch of these photo uh, videos of the, the bird just running around and around the car, because he was, the bird was thinking another bird was encroaching on his space. And, um, he wrote me a um, really sad email. It said he and his family were just devastated because they saw a bird, a cat, catch the bird while it was running around the car. So that's that's those are sad stories. It was a feral cat. Anyway, another big question I get on a happier note is that people ask me if they said they saw a Kaleo with chicks. Chicks, you, you don't want to usually say never, but it's in this case, it's okay. We can say never. They never have chicks here in uh, Hawaii. All the chicks are in, in Alaska and the, the Arctic. And so when you see them hanging around with smaller birds, they're ready turnstones. This was a nice photo sent me by a, a, a Peggy in Hilo. And you can see that the Kalea is look, looking to me at, like she's looking at the turnstone saying, what, what are you guys doing? And you, this is a good picture of the turnstones. Um, in, they, they also molt into beautiful breeding colors right now. So this is what they look like now. But they are another shorebird and the Kalea and the turnstones do hang out together. Those are not their chicks. This is a chick. Wally went uh, to the 2019 to, uh, to Nome and got some pictures of adorable chicks. And notice the legs as big on the chicks as they are as adults. The legs don't change. So he can put adult size bands on these chicks legs. If you can find them, you take all day to find one nest. And I just wanted to share with you this, um, some of so the Kalea fans, the some great joy in my life has been finding out the, all the kinds of Kalea things uh, in Hawaii. And I went to the to wire some money one day and the, and the, the, the bank um, manager had this on her desk. And I said, what's this? And she said, oh, they're just beautiful pictures of, of Kalea that I've taken. And I just wanted to put them on my desk because it makes me feel happy all day. So this was at my bank. Uh, Marianne Long, I do not know. She sent me this uh, uh, picture that she painted. And my uh, neighbor and friend Suzanne Hammer lives in um, Enchanted Lakes and she kept talking about Becky and Andy and I thought they were her neighbors and they're her two birds, her Kalea that spend time in her yard. And so I went over and met Becky and, and uh, Suzanne and it's been great. She actually got two of those Kalea t-shirts to Barack and Michelle Obama. So they are now officially uh, Kalea counters. And this is Becky drinks water out of the plant dish under her uh, plants in her front yard. I, I didn't meet Andy, just Becky. And I wanted to share with you some other great pictures that people have sent me. It's really fun to see those are attachments in the, that you can add in the report page. And this was a, a Kalea with the red bill Leothrix, pretty stunning picture. And people uh, say to me, why do they call them shorebirds? Because they don't hang out on the shore, but I did find they are shorebirds and probably they don't hang on the shore because we've created so many great lawns and golf courses and places for them to forage inland. 
and they they may have foraged inland in in historically, but we don't know that. So, but anyway, I did see these two and uh, on the, on the beach a couple times at Mokalea. And here's one that uh, uh, Robert took from uh, Maui that actually caught a fish. So Wally was really excited about this because he'd never seen one actually in the water catching a fish. And the great news at the end here is that um, Sigrid is a, a, a friend of mine that I met through Wally and she's worked with Wally for years and years. She was a, a teacher and librarian at um, Command Man Schools. And she saw a bird with a leg band that Wally had banded 18 years ago at Punchbowl uh, Cemetery. She lives near there and she counts there religiously and has really great um, numbers and routinely goes there. And so uh, March 26th, a few days ago, she actually got close enough to get a picture of the banded bird and the bird's not nearby. So it's it's sort of off in the distance in, in the section called X. So she named him Mr. X. And so there's her, the bands that Wally put on. I went there yesterday and got some more pictures or two days ago. And Mr. X now Wally says is 18 years, 10 months old. Uh, the record was his bellows bird at 21 years, but this one's hopefully will get that far or longer. And the, the colored bands, it's red on top, plastic, aluminum in the middle with the, the official uh, number, and then a red on the bottom. And while he said he had a different color code for each of the six birds that he banded back in 2004. So we're all pretty excited. And I just want to say, if you do what, decide to go to visit these birds, it's really, really hard to see the bands. And so I have blown this picture way up. I had a, a big lens and even so it's the bands are in the shade under the bird, even when it's in the sun. And so this is a, the blown up picture that that's um, sort of easy to see if you have binoculars, but, but the bird is not that near the road, but you have to stay in your car, near your car. The um, people at Punchbowl really like us to respect what the place is that it's a memorial and it's a solemn place and uh, we can certainly drive in there and visit but we want to stay respectful so um i just want to say thank you all so much for sending me such great pictures and keeping up with the count even though the the reporting site was imperfect and sometimes very confusing some people sent me the numbers by email just because they weren't able to do that. And I will work on that and try to make it easier. We're going to keep going. We'd like, I'd love you to uh, report when the bird, when your bird leaves so we can see, you know, if they all left on the same day or if within a few days. I had a bird on the next year, which really surprised me as all the other birds were gone. So it'd be really interesting to see if that continues. And I just want to thank Wally. He said he keeps emailing saying how much as he misses Hawaii. This was us in Alaska because uh, he can't travel, but he's planning on traveling here next year and doing some more banding and, and all kinds of wonderful things with our birds. And this is our book that you can get from uh, Hawaii Audubon Society helps us uh, support the uh, expenses we have for the Kalea and also the t-shirts if you want to help us advertise the count the t-shirts and also uh, this is our new edition of Hawaii's Birds which we um, put out by the Hawaiian Audubon, Audubon and it's, uh, it's, it's fantastic it's updated and it's got some some really new good sections in it so thank you for watching and listening and helping it's been a very interesting year for everybody and uh, fortunately the Kalea don't really care uh, and we'll see what happens next year. So uh, if you have any questions, I think this is the time that we have put aside to ask some questions. Okay. So Susan, uh, Maya Payne yeah. has a question. So she says, if we find a Kaleo bird that does not appear to be doing well, should we attempt to catch it and bring it to the vet? 
Yeah, the, the the answer to that is if it's if if you can catch it without without it flying, yes, the the veterinary uh, plays feather and called feather and fur as a bunch of vets. It's a really great place here in Kailua. We'll take any injured native bird, and they will evaluate it. And if it's can be if it if it needs if they can help fix it they can t send it to the uh, Hawaii Wildlife Center on the Big Island and they'll rehab it and um, do what it takes. And, and they have taken a bunch of Kalea. If a wing is broken, you can probably catch it. But if the just a leg is broken or, or um, if it just looks really thin, it it's really stresses the bird if it can fly. So the answer is if, if, you, can, if you can catch it, yeah, take it to Feather and Fur here on Oahu. Okay, anybody else? Uh, Yvonne Chan typed in. Yvonne, you want to ask Susan your question? Oh yeah, sorry, I'm... Oh, uh, hi. <laughs> I, just, I just have a couple of questions. One of them was, um, do you clam mate for life? And then the other question was, do they over, do pairs overwinter near each other? Sorry, I'm at home and- like, Yeah, good yeah. questions. Yeah. Well, one of, one of the things that Wally doesn't know is if they form pair bonds here in Hawaii, if they start doing that, their hormones are obviously going for mating, they're molting and they're turning into these gorgeous breeding colors, uh, but, in Alaska, so so I I went I went around at Punchbowl. We found with Sig, and we found several pairs, sort of close together, not right next to each other, but close together that she had not seen together all winter. And she goes, she's gone there many times. So it looks like they're sort of getting together, but we don't know if they're really uh, doing any kind of courting or you know bonding, or if they're get, gathering together to to flock to fly you know migrate but Wally said in in Alaska the males build their nest often in the same place or in the very near place that they did last year and they build these beautiful little wonderful lichen soft fluffy nests on the ground and then the females fly over and check out the nest and the male does a courting flight it's a fluttering up into the air and then he lets her know there's a nest there. And she he thinks she's shopping, that she's looking to see, do I like the nest? Do I like this male's butterfly dance? They call it the butterfly flight, butter, you know, his flight. And then uh, she, if she she choose him. So she he thinks the males are sort of territorial in the Alaska, but that the females shop around. So that so that would imply they do not mate for life. But we don't don't really know that absolutely for sure. And one of the big points that Wally makes all the time is we don't know anything for sure about the bird unless it's banded. So you don't really know the bird in your yard is the same one year after year. You assume it, it's got personality, it knows you, all these things. You were like 90% sure, but he said without a band on its leg to say, this is the same bird you don't know. And that's the problem with Alaska. If the bird's not banded, you don't really know if that female was was there at that same male's nest last year or if it's a new a new mating mating opportunity. So so yeah, lots, lots and lots of questions. And uh, we actually really started out just to do a count and then decided, well, as long as everyone's out looking at birds and counting them, Let's see if we can get some other information. So we'll, we'll see what happens with that. But great questions. Well, thank you. Yeah. Be really nice to know um, if they are sort of pair bonding here. Because the two that I see on the mid pack golf course that I see every day are really far apart all winter. And I've seen them get much closer now. So don't really know what that's about. And then we should talk about the schools getting, yeah, schools. Yeah, the counting. schools, I, yeah. I actually, uh, you know, I, I went to all the golf courses and I would really love to go to the schools. And of course this year that was out of the question. But next year, I would love some volunteers to help me. I can make flyers, we can talk to classrooms. 
and just find out if the if there's a colea on the grounds. That's a great thing to watch and to note when it comes and when it goes or how many you have. I think you have several, right? And then at, at Yolani. And then, um, you know, see if we can get the students to sort of help with counting. One of the great things is with, the, with, with schools, we can uh, get younger people involved in just bird, you know, just watching these birds and go to a park and go to a different place. So I did have some, a father, from Iolani, you had a student at Iolani and they went someplace else and counted Kalea. Uh, so it's a really good family thing to do too, but we need to get the word out, I think through the schools to, to get the kids to say to their parents, so let's go to Capulani Park and count birds. But um, hopefully by the time school rolls around again in August, I, I don't know what's happening with schools right now. Well, none of us really do, but uh, we can uh, plan to that I'm happy to go to, to yeah let's ways. figure out something yeah, Over yeah. and, and, the and Mike the contact on the Kalea site is my email so so you can easily easily contact me there have anybody else contact me uh if we do uh, I, I can do several classes at a time or one you know one big assembly or however we, we decide to do it so Ooh, that would be awesome yeah, I'm really, really disappointed that I, we didn't get to involve the schools more this year. There's one school that has a Kalea as, a, as their mascot, an uh, elementary school. So, but then we couldn't go there. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks Thank for you. reminding me about the schools. <laughs> Anybody else? Hi, this is Maya. Um, I actually learned about you guys through our friends, Michelle and David. Um, and I have, I'm part of a scout troop. So I was thinking I was going to introduce this to the scout troop and then we could have some like patrol activities be doing counts. And, um, it can also, I think a lot of people would be eager to sign up for that. Cause that's really interesting. And, um, actually I was at a recent camp out at just bellows, a little camp and uh -huh. there's a very friendly Kalea bird that kept coming by the table as we were cooking. So that was really interesting. Got a couple photos, but kind of blurry but it was fun yeah yeah that would be great to to uh you know talk to the scout people and you know whoever was interested to to sign on to a place i i'm going to redo the sign up sheet because i wanted to mention zero is a good number you know some people said i i didn't enter anything because i didn't find any birds but zero is a really significant number so we know we want to know more than one year in a row if there's no birds there at all. We maybe take that off as a place to count or it's an easy place to count because you can just go there, see there's no birds, you know, walk through the park once and then we we know that. So um, anyway, I'm working on the sign up sheet. So so keep in touch on that and, and I'll have a link there where people can sign up and then, yeah, have people, you know, take certain areas. We ask for three counts each winter. So if you have two and then eight, you kind of need a third number to decide which of those two numbers to take, right? So you don't know if, it, if there's usually more than two or if the eight was just a, some passing through or what. So three, three counts is ideal. Uh, this year was hard because of everything. So we just take, you know, one counts better than none. So but th three is ideal. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And um, yeah, thank you for that. And you can email me if you want. We could talk about how to do that. Great. Thanks. Uh -huh. And do you happen to have any like flyers in particular that you'd like to be distributed? Because um, that's definitely something I could arrange. Great. That's great. Yeah. Just email me. I made a bunch of flyers. Great. Okay. Thank you. At UH Hilo, who put them around the campus there and around some places on the Hilo side. And I have a, a lot more left over that we just weren't able to do because I wasn't able to travel in Rhode Island. But yeah, I'll definitely, uh, we'll definitely do that. So just contact me and we'll do that, you know, maybe later in the summer before they start coming back. Anybody else? Looks like Richard got a question. Rich. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, 
Are there a second type of Kalea in Hawaii? I have seen some that are almost colorless. They're grays, just uh, different colors of gray and not the golden speckles on them. No, there's only one species. And so there are not different kinds, but you know, like with it, with every every species, there may be different coloration. So you can have you know different shades of color of the same the same animal. But I would think uh, most of the birds are are pretty similar. But um, I, I've seen some that are more pale than others. Yeah, but it's all one species. I've also seen a video of people in Scotland going out and. Uh, photographing. Say again. I have also seen videos, YouTube videos, of people in Scotland going out and photographing Kalea. Oh. And they talked about a different. Really? Thing uh, the Kalea. Um, yeah. so I found it on YouTube. You can probably go check it out. They may have. Yeah, well, it's probably a different kind of plover, but. Uh... There are different species of plovers. Uh, you know, there's American golden plovers, Pacific golden plovers, ours. But we here in Hawaii only have the Pacific golden plovers. And there's, I think, there's a black-bellied plover that occasionally shows up uh, that gets every every all the birders really happy and excited. But mostly, um, I, I think it's just Pacific golden plovers here. I, I can I can ask Wally if he's. I, I, I don't know if there's other shorebirds that are showing up as, you know, birds that are, don't come here very often, but just fly through. If you get a picture, we can show him. He's a shorebird expert. Okay. Send, send me a picture if you get one. I have some that I'll, I'll drop box and I'll send you the link. Okay, great. Great. Are there any okay. other questions? Yes, I just wanted to uh, uh, say that don't overlook our wonderful librarians and public libraries as places to disseminate information about Kalea and they are, you know, right on board to help get kids informed and have children uh, learn more about Kalea. Great. Great idea, thank you. Yeah, I, I will definitely do that. Yeah, librarians are rock stars. <laughs> they, Hello, they, my, uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Kaleo. I just wanted to say that, you know, schools are gonna be opening up this, this fourth quarter. And so not to be um, shy, but bring your flyers out to your schools and approach your principals. This is a great time to do it. A lot okay. of um, special programming are going on it very different schools. Some are going to have summer programs so they can actually get the word out before our kupuna kolea come back in July or August. Okay. Um, we, we know of a bunch of teachers who would be very interested in your flyers, for sure. Great. Okay. That's good to know. Congratulations. Yeah. Great work Thank you. during COVID. Thank you. You're such yeah. a champ. Appreciate all the work you guys are doing. Mahalo. Well, well, thank you. And I appreciate all the suggestions because as I said, that we made this as a pilot study just to see who wants to help and how it's going to go. So we'll, I'll keep working on it to smooth it out. So thanks for sticking with me with some of the things that didn't work as well as other things. So great. There's a question from Rosalind. Rosalind, you want to ask it? Okay. Um, yeah. I. It, I I notice sometimes there are birds that summer uh, here, you know, they, they don't leave. And I wondered if some of them don't bother to change their plumage, if they're just maybe retired from breeding or they're too young and don't breed the first year or whatever, or even the second year. Well, it's a good question. We, we don't know why they spend the summers here. Uh, Wally thinks that there's a, they, they may be underweight. They, ca they cannot make the migration unless they weigh a certain amount. They, they have to have the fat stores to make Alaska. Otherwise, they just fall into the ocean. So if they don't have enough weight, they know it and they'll stay. Mm -hmm. The other thing is they may be injured 
And the other thing is the, the hormone, the breeding, that they, they don't decide to change colors or not. It's, it's a hormonal change. So if they're not healthy, they probably will not go through that because it's very energy intensive to lose all the winter feathers and grow all new spring feathers. And so it all probably has to do with food sources and, you know, disease and, and those sorts of things. But yeah, we don't know for sure why they spend the summers here, but we're happy to see them when we do find one. Yeah, and so let me know where you see some. If I see one, you know. <laughs> Good question. It looks like uh, I think we're hitting at the 7.30 mark. Um, okay. So once again, thank you to our presenter, Susan Scott, for a very informative talk about the Kolea account. Um, I would also like to thank my coworker, Morgan, for helping me assist with the Zoominar. Uh, please feel free to check out our Hanalma Talks YouTube channel as well as our Hanalma Bay Education Program website for other content. Uh, please tune in to next week's talk, uh, Thursday, April 8th. Uh, we are hosting Taya Peniman, and the topic that will be presented will be Birds, Not Mosquitoes, Saving Our Native Forest Birds. So uh, with that, thank you for tuning in to the, tonight's Hanama Bay Education Program Hanama Talk Seminar, and hope you can tune in to next week's seminar. Have a great three-day weekend, and happy Easter. Thank Mahalo. you. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thanks, thank Susan. You. All right. Thank you. Bye. Wonderful presentation. Bye. Bye.